Welcome to the podcast where relationships, confidence, and determination all converge into an amazing heartfelt experience. This is Speaking from the Heart. Welcome back to episode number 76 of Speaking from the Heart. Today we're going to be interviewing Dr. Hector Ortiz, who is a fellow Toastmaster and I have known personally for many years. He is the program manager for diversity and inclusion at Penn State Health System, and previously he served as the senior director of community engagement and partnerships through the Office of Advancement and Strategic Initiatives at Central Penn College, located in Enola, Pennsylvania. From 2015 to 2020, he also served as an assistant professor and director of graduate studies at the college, and he is a leadership Harrisburg area graduate, graduating in 2005. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering, a master's degree in diplomacy, and a doctorate degree in international relations, which you will hear quite clearly the international perspective that we talk about, especially with the topic at hand, which is mostly focused on leadership in this episode. Hector has also obtained the highest Toastmasters Education Award, Distinguished Toastmaster, and he received that in 2018. He's currently the author of two books, The Creative Energy of Positive Thinking and Six Assets to Grow Personally and Advance Professionally, which we also talk about in this episode. What I really found interesting to really kick off this new year for us, and especially learning a lot more about what we can do in the realm of leadership and communication, is that we can learn so much from just influences, not only from around us, but also Who do we hang out the most that gives us those thoughts and perceptions, which really helps us to understand not only the ways in which we can approach different subjects, especially in the new year, but also how we can change our opportunity to be happy and be able to be successful while making achievements overall. I think that this might be the wake-up call that we might need to help us to start with our goal planning and especially making ourselves more accountable for what we can do within our own leadership realm. But with that, let's go to the episode. All right, we're here with Dr. Hector Ortiz. Hector, thanks for sharing your heart with us today. Thank you for the invitation. It is really a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to share some thoughts and some stories and some uh, intentions and commitments as an individual, as a professional, with an audience that I am sure is willing to learn, is willing to share, is willing to know how many people can be able to support, to help, to inspire. And I hope after this uh, podcast, we can be able to promote the opportunity that people feel in a different way, hopefully a proactive way to live a beautiful life that I am living at this moment. I have to tell you, that is the most awesome opening to when I say thanks for sharing your heart with us today that I've had yet. So thanks for that, because really that's my goal, Hector, every time that I have somebody on the show is to be able to do just that. So thank you for that great insight to help our audience kind of dive into it. And I want to also say full disclosure, because I already introduced you to the audience, that I've known you for a number of years now because of Toastmasters. And for those that are interested in checking out Toastmasters International, my listeners have known this very well now. You can go to the episode notes, click on the Toastmasters International link, and can go and visit a local club closest to you, whether that's in person or online, and learn more about how you can network with others. But Hector, I've done enough of a shameless plug. What I want to do is really talk a lot about some of the things that you have accomplished in your life. Because first off, I introduced you as Dr. Hector Ortiz. And I think that it's always amazing to see people move through their educational journey to get to where they are at. I have been a shameless plug myself of having two master's degrees. So my first question to you is, how did you get to ultimately earn your doctorate? Why did you have this pursuit of thinking of education being truly important for yourself? Thank you for the question. And I really, truly believe that education is one of the ways that every single individual, any person in the world can be able to create social mobility, can be able to achieve goals and intentions, objectives and can be able to move in any direction that that individual wants to do in life. 
I really believe that education is that equalizer, that independently how you start, whatever neighborhood, whatever family you come from, that education allows any person, any individual to exercise the liberties, the intentions, and to pursue whatever they want to pursue in life. I am thankful, grateful. I had a father that liked to read. And when I saw that intention to promote education, to ensure that their children become educated, it's something that you don't have to convince me two times. I really knew from the beginning that education was the key. And I'm so happy, so thankful for the opportunity to get educated at the higher level, to go to the elementary school, to go to high school, to enter to college, graduate from college, get a master's degree, and then a PhD. I did all at once because I really believe in the power of education. With that, because you have done so much different education, I know that you have taught for a number of years in Central Penn College, which for my listeners, Central Penn is in Enola, Pennsylvania, which is close to the state capitol. Do you have that sense that you wanted your students to also have that same passion as you did when it came to learning? And if so, how did you go about showing that to your students? Was there some sort of way, a methodology? What were your tactics to help them get inspired? Let me tell you that Toastmasters play an important, I will say a fundamental role in that opportunity that I have to teach at Central Penn College. I taught for at least six years. I was the director of programs at the master's degree level and organizational leadership. Basically, the two elements that Toastmasters highlights so very well, communication and leadership. And I was teaching these two subject matters at the master's degree level. When I had the opportunity to talk with people who has already degrees because they have bachelor's degree in order to pursue the master's degree, I had to talk to them about leadership. And what's amazing, it was a journey to have the opportunity to see middle management leaders already who were in the journey to learn about leadership, to practice leadership, to utilize not just what the textbook says, not just what the best practices, the experiential learning says, but also the opportunity to digest and have conversation with these leaders on how they want to be better leaders. It's not just the style that they may have. It's not just the approach that they can have. It's the opportunity to digest when, how, what, and who is going to be using that particular approach on leadership, which is extremely connected with communication. In my first classes with any students, I usually say there is two elements that you need to create leadership. One is communication. Without communication, there is no leadership to be able to communicate. The second way is influence. And without influence, you are not a leader. You are not able to convince, to persuade anyone that you are not a leader. You have to have followers. You have to have a group of people who are able to move with you in any particular direction. But integrity is what, in my view, play leadership. The style is something else, but the foundation pillars of leadership start with communication, continues with influence, and is able to create whatever leadership style you, have, you would like to get from life. I love that because you and I have had these sort of conversations over coffee about how it, different leaderships can have different ways in which we produce results. And I've always been excited, especially as a student myself, to learn about those sort of topics because I think that one sort of leadership style and doing that continuously does not necessarily mean that you yield the same results every time. You might have to change. You have to warp. You have to have, like you said, these two elements, communication and influence. Speaking of which, I think this is a great time to talk about the two books that you have written as it relates to that. I'm holding both of them for my listeners because I've been really a fan of reading and learning about different perspectives and Dr. Ortiz definitely has a lot of those when it comes to this subject. Hector, you talk about in your first book, The Creative Energy of Positive Thinking, a basic approach to the genuine concept of happiness. And then just recently, you have written Six Assets to Grow Personally and Advance Professionally, a practical approach to reach lifelong fulfillment. With both of these, 
And I know that this is probably a very loaded question, which I hope that maybe you can condense for us. Why write these two books? Why do you feel that leadership, especially with thinking about and learning about the ways in which we can do it, which is kind of the theme in both of those books, why do you feel that is really important? Because I could easily say, this is the way I always do it. That's why it always works. But obviously, you disagree with that premise because of some of the things that you've written. Do you mind talking about both of them and kind of wrapping those together for us? Absolutely. And let me start with the creative energy of positive thinking. I was with a good friend of mine, Mr. Grant Hetrick, who is the coroner of Dauphin County and a good friend of mine. And one day he told me, why don't write a book? Just start writing. You have very good cops. And one of the reasons that I was convinced to write my first book, The Creative Energy of Positive Thinking, is when I saw so much negativism in people. Now, I am not trying to excuse that many of us face very difficult times in Earth. And many of us may not have the resources that others have. And it's going to be difficult for each one. However, the point of the creative energy of positive thinking is that all depends with the way that you see things. And in my view, if the way that you see things is going to be giving you the perspective to see opportunities to move forward, to resolve whatever issues you may face, or if you see the other ways, you are going to be seeing just struggles, challenges, and how difficult life is, and you don't have everything that you need to resolve those issues. So all is the perspective that the individual brings. And my point is that should be always an opportunity to see anything from an optimistic perspective. And if you just take that chance to see things from a proactive perspective, you are going to be able to see that life is not easy, not difficult, that life is not unfair, that life is what you decide to be, what you decide to become, what you decide to pursue, because at the end, it's just you, the only person who determines how much, how far, how fast you want to go in life. And again, one of the things that you can get from that book that I got myself, and I emphasize the importance of this is to create a mission statement of life, personal mission statement of life. If you don't know where you are going, if you don't know what you are doing in life, then it's going to be difficult to have the opportunity to create happiness. It's going to be difficult to have the opportunity to see optimistic points of view. So I recommend, I emphasize the importance to start any human being with analyzing where you are and where you would like to be, what you are doing now and what you would like to be in whatever time you have the opportunity to live. In other words, a mission a statement of life which is for any organization, is a mandate. There is no organization that is successful if they don't have a mission statement. I am asking the same para logic with the people that you should have a mission statement of life. And I was able to develop my and revise on an annual basis after writing this book, The Created Energy of Positive Thinking. Before you move to the second book, that is something that I think is truly important is, like you said, having that mission statement for ourselves so that we know where that direction leads. And I love this book in itself because it walks through not only how you can start to develop that for your own, but starts to challenge some of that thought process as well that you might have already existing. And I think it's really about deconstructing a little bit. And Maybe as a question to that, Hector, is there something that maybe you talk about in the book or even maybe you recommend to people, because I know you do consulting as well, is there something that you recommend to individuals or even businesses for that matter to help dispel that breaking of that thought pattern that might be toxic or might be negative in nature? Is there a first step that you would recommend? Because as a coach myself, I feel like I do that quite a lot with my clients. And that means trying to say this message that you've been telling of yourself might not be the message that you should be sharing with others or even with your significant other. It's about really 
working on a different viewpoint. So is there something that you recommend to people that helps them to get started with that process? Well, one of the things that you can see in the book is there is a lot of research. There is a lot of other people who have wrote about this particular topic of positive thinking and the influence that positive thinking can create in the minds of people. Therefore, there is many other resources that people can go and read. Carnage is one, how to make friends and enjoy life, right? It's one of the sources that I have read many times, the Carnage books. The uh, tremendous John book said that there is a local author that has been, again, changing lives. So you had many other sources that can be utilized and many other self-help books that are available that people can consider to learn, to utilize what many others has written about it. But if you ask me one thing that you need that anyone should utilize is to believe in yourself. Start with that. Start with believing in yourself. And many people not are able to do. Many people are not just afraid to make mistakes, are afraid to move forward. Believe me or not, and I mentioned this in the book, many people are afraid even to be successful. Hmm. You say, people can be afraid of being successful. Well, they have not seen people around being successful, so they don't even believe that success may exist because that's the resources, the neighborhood, what they see. And unfortunately, people tend to reflect of what they see. If they're around good people, there is a saying that the five people that become your best friends or the people you hang around all the time, you become the operators of those five people that you are around. And that's true in many ways. And I challenge all of the listeners today to analyze who are the five people that you go around regularly on periodic basis, that you get loans, that you breakfast, that you talk. And you may be the operators in everything income, spirituality, emotional, many ways that you can analyze, measure success. And we are part of that. So basically, the people that you are around help you to reflect what you would like to do. And with education, with learning, by reading, by trying to get something else, you can get out of that status quo, of that average and move forward. That's what social mobility is all about. That is some really good advice. And I think especially just having those five people, I was literally thinking in my mind right now, who are the five closest people that I associate with? And it reminds me so much that I did that exercise a few years ago when I initially paged through your book. And I haven't done that in a while. It makes me rethink that I should do that again. And I think it's always good to revisit it because like you even said earlier, that influence, that communication, those things change quite often. Now, I want to move to the second book, The Six Assets to Grow Personally and Advance Professionally. How did this book come out of the woodwork, if you will, of your experiences or your associations? Because I would have said, man, one book having the creative energy, positive thinking, that enough in itself could say so much. So I guess my question is, why a second book? And what is it that it does for people that if they want to pick up that, why would they want to read that, Hector? Thank you again for the question. And let me share with the audience that in many occasions, many people have approached me and have shared how this book has changed his or her life. And just having one person, if one person come to me and say, this book helped me to change my life or help me where I am now, I think the book fulfilled an intention. But many people, co-workers, social workers, students, and people who have shared with me, even a co-worker that I have now said, my son read this book, and do you know how much he loves and how much he enjoyed? And he was even going to commit suicide. And when so this perspective, the different analogies, the different stories of the book try to connect with the top principle, create that opportunity that people see life from different perspectives. So that itself helped me to evaluate that maybe something else can be done 
And that's what the second book that was just published this year came after those intentions to develop not just the proactive approach, not just the positive thinking approach, but how we can develop the individual itself. The six assets to grow personally and achieve professionally emphasize the need to grow and to develop yourself as an imperative to fulfill personal and professional aspirations. It helps also that individuals, people or individual professionals can also have the opportunity to read three elements that are so important in life, peace, success, and happiness. And success and happiness and peace can be seen from different perspectives. Depends where you are, depends how much, because success for an individual who is poor who may not have education, is just to have a job. And that person had a sustainable job may be success. For people who have a sustainable job and may have education, success may be seen differently and analyze different angles, different ways that people see success, that people see happiness, that see people see peace. And in that way, you develop the individual, try to understand what are the ways, what are the alternatives to develop the individual, create not just a positive thinking approach, but how much the feelings involve the decision that people make, how much is important to enhance the state of self-awareness, awareness, decision-making, and analyze as an individual and as a professional the different decisions that we make on a daily basis, not just as an individual, not just as a professional, but as a holistic approach of the individual and try to analyze the different perspectives that people bring. So in that way, you analyze the six assets, the six chapters that we present to the individuals and to the professionals on how to better understand life from these two perspectives. It's good to have a formula or a roadmap, if you will, to more clearly put it, and to help us to move from that point where we are to another, which is always an important subject in itself to help us not only stay on track, but I feel that when we have those conversations, we can be more intentional, more rationalized with, okay, this is the pillar that I'm in. What is it that I can do to continue to grow in that while I'm working on these other pillars Maybe concurrently, maybe the next step, whatever that pace is for people, because especially with some guests that I've had on this show, Hector, I definitely have learned a lot about the fact that we all have different ways. We have different brain styles in which we develop that, too. And I think that this leads into my next question. Now, moving past the books, which I encourage my listeners to pick up, I'll put a link in the episode notes. If you are interested in purchasing them, they are available online. And I'm really interested in the fact that you have moved on into the Penn State health system. You became a program manager for diversity and inclusion. Why the pivot? Why move to now thinking about these conversations of DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion? Is it in the same vein of what you've written about and which you're helping people to understand what those differences are? What do you say is your mission with serving in such a role like this? Because truthfully, you could have stayed in education and continue to inspire a whole generation of students thinking about these topics and talking about them. But why the change? I'm curious. Thank you for the question again. That's a fair question. Um, Diversity, equity, and inclusion play a fundamental role in decision making. Cultural differences is a huge, huge animal that many people tend to believe that they know, they understand, and they are fine because they just understand differences. But from my years of experience, in even just understanding one of the elements of the multiple hundreds of differences that we share as a human beings, income, for instance, not just economic, not just socioeconomic, not just the opportunity to generate well, but income in America is very disproportionate. And I am even seeing now the discussion about slavery and so many benefits, benefits in quotation marks, create slavery. And I was just afraid to even start a discussion like that when we 
know that politically slavery was defending in the South and was against in the North, and that was created the Civil War many years ago. But the main point is that diversity, equity, and inclusion is something that we are involved all the time. The question is, are you prepared? Are you ready to accept differences? And many people are not. Many people tend to believe that my culture is better than others, that my religion is better than others, that my approach about gender, ethnicity, national origin is better than others. And the point is that at the end, any culture is not even worse or is not better than anyone else. We are just different. And we don't have any right to make another person to believe just in me because I think my culture is better than others. I don't have any right to make another person to change the culture because it's something that you belong to, that you come from, and it's part of you. And if you want to demonstrate the authenticity that any single human being has, we are not open and able to showcase, to demonstrate, to create a world when diversity, equity, and inclusion can live, can transpire, can be exercised by any single individual. When we are able to allow people to do the true selves, to be able to come to a particular session meeting environment and share their ways of thinking, their ways of doing, the tradition, customs, and ways of acting based on their experiences, then we are going to be able to allow any human being to present and even be better because diversity at the end from the business perspective, great productivity, enhance the opportunity, create teamwork, and allow more involvement and engagement when we are truly focused in the greatness of diversity and guests try to fight who think like me or who doesn't think like me. In leadership, there is a task that, that the leader is not a person who knows everything. The leader is the person who knows a little bit about leadership, who knows a little bit about how to be successful, but is able to put together a team of people when you have the talent of those areas that you are not aware, that you are not very good, and then you rely on people. I don't know just any leader in the world that can say, I did by myself. We need a group of people. We need a team. And that's what leadership communication influence because if you are able to communicate the vision and you are able to influence the why, then you are going to be able to have people who can follow to that particular vision, intention, goal, or objective. But you need to have a team and the team has to be very diverse in thinking, in action, in aspiration, in intentions, and that's the role of the leader, to put together everyone in the right seat so the past to succeed in life can be achieved and can be generated. But that vision that the leader brings, but that team members that allow the vision of the leader to be successful. John Maxwell says the leader is more worried about the vision than the people. The people are not worried about the vision, but the leader. So the group of people select first the leader. The leader selects first the vision, not the people. So that's what you had when you had a vision and then the people will come and generate any opportunities to generate change and hopefully aspirations and satisfactions in the future. Wow. Those are some pretty profound statements. And I think that you reinforce even what some of my other guests have said, and I have to call this out specifically even right now about the fact that we need that team. I've had people on the show have called that our universal team. I have heard it called our sphere of influence. I've heard it called the group in which helps us to get to where we need to go. But you make a very convincing statement and argument here about why it's so important as well to have that in a leadership context, especially with the work that you do. Because it helps us to now see that global picture as opposed to that individualistic picture. And I think that is so important to see those world diverse views. And I love the way you hear it because sometimes I feel like we put it into another category or we dump it into something else that we're trying to make this point. And then it comes back to being individualistic. But 
I love the way you just explained that because I think it opens up this whole other conversation in itself that I know that we won't have time to do in this episode. Maybe we'll bring you back and talk about it some more. But I love the fact that you called that out for what it is. And I appreciate that. And Hector, as we get closer to the end of the time, I want to ask you this one final question because it really has been something of intrigue for me personally. And I think that for my listeners, it might help to shine a little bit about who you are and why you do what you do. I know that you've been involved with Rotary. I know that you've been involved in Toastmasters. That's how I met you. And we have developed a strong friendship over these years in which I've been able to not only have you work for me, but have worked for you as well alongside doing all kinds of different things. Do you feel that your way of giving to other people is to help them see these ideas of positive thinking and leadership? Do you feel that you see each person as being this big melting pot of opportunity? Because I feel like that's your worldview. That's to me what I think. But please educate me on this and my listeners, because I think this passion just rings through with even with some of our conversation that we've had today. And I think it will help us to understand that motivation that you have inside yourself. Thank you for the question. And thank you for those kind words, again, kind words that help to move forward, to keep doing what we are doing. In the book and again in life, I always think that in summary, whatever type of life any individual wants to live, if we are able to summarize in my personal view, and I respect any other views, there is three lives that people can live. You can live a life of pleasure or happiness. You can live a life of success or achievement. Or you can live a life that, again, is uh, so important and is so much needed, which is a life of meaning. In other words, you can have multiple opportunities to create the life that you would like to get. But in summary, when you put people together, even in one way or another, people want to live a life of pleasure, a life of success, or a life of meaning. Let me start with the last one because of your question. Meaning is something higher than yourself. And that can be seen from the spiritual viewpoint, from the brain uh, rationality viewpoint, from the emotional viewpoint, from the physical view. All depends where you would like to start analyzing the meaning. In my view, meaning is when you're able to do something not just for yourself, but for others. That's what Rotary contemplates. That's what community service come to play, that's what servant leaders come to play, the opportunity to share the privileges that we have, because I feel privileged. My education gives me privilege. The position that I have teaching gives me privilege. The position to serve the community gives me privilege. Those privileges, if they are using, not just to advance yourself, your family, the people around you, but to advance others. And let me tell you something that I wrote in the first book. In my view, the best thing that anyone can do for someone else is not just give physical resources. Of course, many people need those and it's fine to give when they need that. But the best way that any individual can help someone else is to be able to discover themselves, the talents, the attributes, the things that people have. And if you are able to believe in someone else, if you are able to discover the talents and the attributes that people have, you're able to help themselves. That's the key point, Josh. When people are able to help others to help themselves, to believe in themselves, to see things from a proactive perspective, that creates meaning. That creates meaning to life. That can create meaning to the profession. That can create meaning to the individual. That's what meaning is all about. And that's just one of type of life that people can live. And if you combine that one with success that, again, I mentioned to you, can be different because the pains of the individual is in the eye of the beholder what success is all about. And in that way, success can be achieved. And then in that way, if you have success and you have meaning, pleasure will come by default. So you depends what angle you see, what life you prefer, but you are able to live these three types of life, combining and achieving 
then I live what I think I live, a life of pleasure, a life of success, a life of meaning. I am so grateful for the life that I have. I'm grateful for the life that you have too because of the influences that you've had touched other people, including even myself with, which I think is a perfect segue to wrap up. I know that you do public speaking about this topic. You have done coaching and consulting relating to this. I want to give you the last few minutes, Hector. How can people reach out to you if they are interested in talking more about this with you? Because this has been a great conversation and we only scratched the surface today. But what if people want to learn more about this? Is there a way that they can reach out to you? I'm going to give you the last few minutes to go ahead and pitch yourself. Thank you. Absolutely. You can reach me and you can find me in LinkedIn. You can find me in Facebook. You can find me in my website, www.drhectorortiz.com. And you can find me in my books. I had pages in Facebook, in social media, connected with the created energy of positive thinking and the six assets to succeed personally and advance professionally. You can reach me again. You are going to be sharing my contact information that I am able to go and talk with people about this, to communicate the best way that people may have in order to live a better life. But again, at the end, is the decision of the individual. At the end, is the commitment of the individual. Nothing is easy in life. Nothing is difficult in life. You have to pay a price, and we all know that. Whatever we are doing, we pay a price. Even for doing nothing, we are paying a price. The price of spending our time doing nothing. But we have to pay in one way or another. People tend to believe when we ask to pay, it's just monetary resources. But we pay socially, economically, politically, culturally. We pay emotionally, spiritually, rationality. We pay in one way or another. In that set way, I would like to emphasize anyone who is giving me the opportunity to listen today to Joss and myself to think about life. What you would like to get from life? What are you doing now in life? Where are you? Are you happy with where you are? Because if you are, then you just have to start planning what is going to be next, how you can find meaning, how you can find success, or how you can find happiness. But at the end, it's your decision. It's your life. I am just here sharing good practices that I am living, that I am practicing, and I think work. And just share those because I have the privilege to have an education, a family, and now a commitment to create a life that I don't have to wait to retirement to enjoy. I enjoy every single second. And I hope all of you who are here today can enjoy your life at it comes and every single second because life is beautiful. The world you cannot have the opportunity to see and to observe and to contemplate with the life that we have with the number of years. Life cannot be measured by the number of years, but the seconds that you enjoy each opportunity that life offers to all of us. I think that time is valuable. And that's what you're definitely summarizing is that we can use our time to help others and even help ourselves to see that light that's within ourselves and what we want to get out of life. And I certainly have gotten a lot out of this conversation as for my listeners too. And with that said, Hector, thanks for being on Speaking from the Heart today. It was a true privilege and honor to get to talk to you about your books, about you, what motivates you, and more importantly, how you are a great leader overall. And with that, I value our friendship as a result of all of those things. So thank you again. Thank you. I want to thank Hector again for being part of the show. And he really shared with us some interesting perspectives about the topic of leadership, which he not only brings the international perspective on, but also has studied it for so long that a lot of those different techniques that he has talked about in this episode, I know for a fact he has lived in person. And I think that really generates a lot of the conversation that we can have not only about ourselves, but also the ways in which we can make progress in the right direction. With those things in mind, we can definitely think about the goals. We can think about ways in which we can have intentionality in our lives being able to teach, to be able to learn. Those are things that we learn at such a young age to adapt as behaviors that oftentimes are forgotten about when we get into the later parts of our life. 
Until, of course, we get some kids that we raise, and then those all come flooding back into our minds as to the level of importance they have. And I think he talked a lot about that, particularly when we made it to the spheres of influence or the elements of leadership, more specifically, which he talked about communication and influence. But we don't have to have those same resources that other people have that allow us to go forward in a direction that is really needed to be optimistic, to be creative in the way in which we deliver ourselves. I know that for many of us, we can think about leadership as a way or a tool to help us get to that next point. And I teach a lot of this, maybe on my clients that are going through my business and they're thinking about ways in which they can take themselves to the next level. I even deal with that at work when it relates to the different types of opportunities that exist when it comes to not only providing that creativity when it comes to leading others, because we often have to think outside of the box, but we also have to have good communication style to be able to do just that. I often think of people like Dale Carnegie, John Maxwell, even some of those notable figures that we talk about today, Warren Buffett, maybe even a Steve Jobs who's no longer with us, who definitely tried to create some of the unique cultures that we have and we can experience. But those are just the juggernauts. Those are just the people that overall create some of those things that we have in our lives that we often think can be the role models. But why can't we just believe in ourselves? Why can't we just believe in our success of being able to be a good leader? And I really love the fact that Hector talked about who are the five people that you go around with on a periodic basis that you surround yourself with? Because I had to stop myself, even in this episode, to think about what are some of the things that I could learn from just being able to separate the individuals that I have in my life that create that sort of unique persuasion of sorts to try to be able to take a big step back and say, maybe I don't need to go in this direction. I think that the other question that we have to ask ourselves is, how much can we change our thoughts or perceptions in that bigger, greater framework of leadership? Because let's face it, we all know that we have different perceptions and attitudes that we go into when it comes to not only the ways in which we lead others, but also the ways in which we communicate, which we gain that influence. Now, I'm not about to go out to give staff or people that I would supervise a whole bunch of money to say that, yes, you need to be influenced by me, so I'm going to pay you more above what you even get paid now, because then that expectation will always be there. Although money is a nice reward, it doesn't always mean that it provides the right answer. But it also means don't have a pizza party every single Friday because then somebody knows that maybe something's up after that 15th, 20th, 25th pizza party in a row. But I think what's really important here is to understand what the importance is for our decision making. What can we be surrounded with in our nebulous or environment that we work in that help to create some of that awareness for ourselves to be able to learn and grow. Companies can easily turn to a survey that helps to survey the population of an audience, aka employees, or even bosses for that matter, in ways in which we can promote our own individual growth to help us to understand what are the true possibilities that exist before us. But I think what is really important here is that we need to be our true selves in order to get that best feedback. We need to have our team around us that allows us to understand that change has to occur. But the change, especially even what Dr. Ortiz provided in this episode, is about understanding that positive aspect of it, the pleasure or the happiness that comes with it, the success or the achievement or even having meaning. And I think that for many of us, we forget about that last part, the meaning aspect of it, in which we are able to recognize and engage with other people because we bring context to it. Because accepting differences in the ways in which we approach subjects help to embrace our differences inside not just ourselves, that just me mentality, 
but it opens up a whole new world of understanding our decision-making process. Sound familiar? It might be something that we might have missed, especially in United States politics, or go to any country around the world in which you might need to have a better understanding of the opposing viewpoint, which is why the concept of debate go all the way back to Greek-Roman times, in which those individuals, those that were representing other individuals for that matter, were pontificating or speaking about the different ways in which they can provide support for a position that is in mind. But I think that we often forget about the fact that we need to find the best way to help not only ourselves, but those that are around us. To help us to discover the talents and attributes of those other individuals that we are gifted to be around. I already hear the grumbling now. Josh, there's no way I'm going to work with Sally today because she's just so grumpy. She is just terrible to work with. How could you ever expect me to have such a positive attitude around somebody like that? Maybe not relatable? Let's try this scenario instead. Josh, there is no way that Bob is going to be able to get that deadline done. And as many times as I keep telling him the importance of the deadline, he just does whatever he wants. He doesn't care what I have to say. I have no value in front of him. I think that we have to take a big step back and ask ourselves this question. If we ever face that opportunity of leading others, especially in this new year, we can ask ourselves this question. What do you want to get out of that situation? What is the meaning of being able to ask Sally, what is going on? Or are I even asking Bob, what is going on? Because I think that it's so much more than just a list of papers that detail our mission, our vision, our values. Maybe even the goals in which we can learn so much and create that intention in our lives to in order to understand how to best move forward. Because it isn't just about the fact that we need to be communicators or even influencers for that matter. But it's about understanding not just those five people that are around us, but the people that aren't around us either. Because they do leave a mark on us. They do change who our thoughts, who our perceptions, and even our frameworks are when it comes to the bigger scheme of things. What is the important awareness or decision-making that we should be making? Because it isn't just about embracing differences, not just the physical side of it. It's about embracing what we can potentially become. And it means also bring some people alongside of it that might need to hear that message more than once and recognizing that we all go in different directions. We are now in the year 2024. And I know that for many of us, we might be lost in which ways that we can move forward. But I think that this important interview really considers the fact that we don't need to have all the answers. But what we do need to have is some assets to be personally enabled to think creatively. Because I think if we're able to do that, not only are we going to make it to the next step, no matter what that is, no matter if we defined it or not yet, but we're going to be able to push forward. And I think that surrounding yourself with someone, maybe even this coach that's speaking to you right now, for that matter, can help you get to the ways that you want to be, especially in the new year. Because let's face it, it's never too late to get started. Aren't you going to get started now? Aren't you going to stop talking in the ways in which you think are going to be done and actually take action on them? Because I think you're ready for change. Aren't you? I am, and all I need is to hear from you. Thanks for listening to episode number 76 of Speaking from the Heart, and I look forward to hearing from your heart very soon. Thanks for listening. For more information about our podcast and future shows, Search for Speaking from the Heart to subscribe and be notified wherever you listen to your podcasts.
Visit us at www.yourspeakingvoice.biz for more information about potential services that can help you create the best version of yourself. See you next time.